memory. First thing we'll take a look at is the nature of memory. Einstein quote, memory is deceptive because it's colored by today's events. I don't know how deep that, how much deeper that could be, but usually when we talk about memory, memories are according to our experiences, but how we perceive how the experience went. Two people can uh, have witnessed an incident and tell totally different stories. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit more about that. First, of course, we need to run, have some terminology for you to be able to follow. Understand that memory is considered to be an internal record or at least a representation of some type of event or experience. When we talk about constructive process, we're talking about how we are organizing as well as shaping the information uh, during the processing as well as storage and retrieval of our memories. Memory is not a videotape uh, because, you know, when we talk about our experiences, even though we have the mighty, mighty smartphone, our minds are not going to pick up everything the same way as if we use the smartphone. Memory is constructed. So let's talk about some of the memory models that exist. We're specifically looking at the encoding, storage, and retrieval model. And when we're speaking about that, think about how memory is formed through at least three processes. One is going to be encoding. And encoding, we're talking about how is, we're getting that information. <clears throat> Uh, and then storage is how we're going to retain that information to use later on. Then we finally have retrieval. That's being able to recover the information that we had stored. So when we're talking about encoding processing information into the memory system, our storage retaining information is going to be, again, for future use. Retrieval recovery um, information, it comes from our memory storage. Now, traditionally, the three-stage memory model consists of <clears throat> what you see on the slide, that being our sensory memory storage, short-term memory storage, then long-term uh, memory storage. Each of these boxes are representing a separate memory system. And again, it'll differ in terms of its purpose, the duration, as well as the ca uh, capacity. So when information is not transferred from our sensory memory or from the short-term memory, then we can assume it's going to be lost. Information that's stored in long-term memory we, and can be retrieved and sent back to the short-term memory for use <clears throat> is, is something that we'll consider to be more permanent. So, in terms of sensory memory, the first memory stage holds our sensory information. It's relatively very large capacity, but guess what? It only lasts just for a few seconds. Our iconic memory, <clears throat> this is to be able to demonstrate the duration of our physical and iconic memories, which if you think about a, a flashlight, like how you see in, uh, in this, on the slide, when it swings uh, in the dark, you're able to see that image or icon and that it lingers for a fraction of a second after that flashlight is moved. So basically what happens is you see the light as a continuous stream, just as like in a photo, rather than it being in a succession of individual points. Echoic memory is when we're able to think back to times when someone asks you a question while you were deeply absorbed within a tax. So here you might have been asked what, and then immediately you'll, you could find an answer uh, to the question without hearing them repeat the response. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about how it's echoic. 
Now, you know, you, you understand and know why you're able to just grab it and pull it without saying, excuse me, huh? <laughs> now, a weaker echo or echoic memory of auditory information pretty much only lasts four seconds. And you want to kind of keep, <clears throat> excuse me, keep up within your readings and jot down and make notes of the times because pretty much some of those questions may ask you how long would be sensory um, memory, how long is short-term memory, and so forth. So make sure that you're jotting down or highlighting all those particular areas so that you can work them into long-term uh, memory. Talking about short-term memory, a couple of things that I want you to make sure that you recall and remember. One, think about when you're studying. How do you study? Usually, you're going to take the information and you keep doing it in a repetitive way until you start remembering everything. This is that repeating of information is how we take things from our sensory memory and move it into our short term memory. <clears throat> OK, so this is going to be one of those slides that I'm going to want you to think about and pause, taking a look at everything that goes in line on terms of talking about short term memory. Chunking. You know what chunking is? Chunking is when we take groups of letters or groups of words or groups of numbers and put it in a way that we, when we're repeating it, we're able to recall that information. Okay? It helps to demonstrate the limits of short-term memory. So, like if we say 7 plus or minus 2, and then one of the things that's a good advantage about chunking is being able to read the... Uh, letters individually at a rate that's about one second okay so what i want you to do is kind of concentrate on trying to remember as many letters as possible uh that you would hear me say and then try to repeat them back to you so i'm only going to say it once then pause the video and so try to bring it back to yourself so are you ready great here we go and F L C B S U S A V C R F B I. All right, please pause the video and repeat what I just said back to yourself. And then you'll be able to start the video and go back and check yourself to see if you were able actually able to recall the letters that i just gave you now there was 15 letters all together and usually when you know you'll be some will have the ability to have recalled every letter that i said um but this is to give you a way to understand what the principle of chunking is or <clears throat> occasionally because you've heard it at a party or, at, or during another class. So that's what I want you to do. Make sure, If you didn't get it, take a listen to it and try it again. Because remember, when we repeat things, what happens? We start to push that more into the short-term memory. And then it also starts working toward the long-term memory. All right, so with that being said, we're going to move on. Just remember that chunking is grouping separate pieces of information in a single unit in order to recall and place in the short term memory. Now, long term memory. Here's where it gets fun because it's where we are now trying to take information from short term memory and lock it in our personal file cabinet within our brain to keep it for always and forever. Now there's been studies that's been out there in terms of looking at how we remember and recall. And there's a study that showed that the parts of the brain that's controlling learning and memory were big, were, were extremely large in, in uh, cab drivers from London. Their brains, they had a lot to hold on to. Why? Because they had a lot of streets and in and outs uh, that they have to contend with. So in order to help them to store that detail, 
they created what we call mental maps of the city that they live in. Now, do it really take a big brain to be a cab driver? No. But what it does take is an ability to learn ways of how to lock and place information into long-term memory. So re remember now, long-term memory <clears throat> is the third memory stage that stores information for long periods of time. The capacity of it is limitless and the duration usually is permanent, usually, not always. Now there's things that we have is, um, within long-term memory. That being first we'll discuss that you can look at it along well, on the slide about explicit or declarative memory. Now this is a subsystem that's within the long-term memory that pretty much is going to store facts, information, as well as your personal life experiences. With explicit declarative memory, one can be, you know, divided into two more parts. That being semantic memory, which is a memory for general knowledge, for rules, events, facts, or a specific type of information. And then the other side of the coin would be episodic memory. And here, this is like our diary, so to speak, a mental diary. And what's happening is it will record major events or episodes. <clears throat> that's going on in your life. So for some of the episodic memories, they can be short-lived, whereas there'll be others that would last your entire lifetime. Like I can recall the first day I learned how to cook a can of Chef Boyardee when I was five years old. And I was standing on a little stool in front of the stove in my mother's kitchen. That's an episodic memory. And so far, so good. Even at my age, I'm still recalling it. So let's move to the next one. Let's talk about implicit or non-declarative type of memory. Now, this is a subsystem within um, long-term memory that's actually consistent of unconscious procedural skills, uh, things that simply been classically conditioned. Uh, and y'all remember classical conditioning, right? Because we just went through that. But it's weird, it's been classically conditioned responses as well as priming. Think about when you learned how to ride a bike. That's a great example of it, okay? Procedural. The procedural motor skills is like trying your shoes on, or as I mentioned, riding a bike. Classically conditioned memory responses like fears or even taste aversions falls under this category. When we're talking about priming, this is where prior exposure to a stimulus or to help you remember prime will facilitate or help inhibit the process of new information. So priming will often occur even when we do not consciously remember being exposed to the prime. <coughs> Excuse me. So what's ways that we can improve long-term memory? Well, one, through organization, and more or less organizing is pretty much allowing us to arrange a number of set of um, variables or items into different categories that would allow us to divide it up and then sub subdivide it even more or break it down even more to help us to remember better. It helps us with um, becoming more understanding about the material we're using and allowing us to lock it in. Again, let's talk back about rehearsal. Rehearsal is that maintenance rehearsal, and that's when you're trying to get um, information to stay within your short-term memory from the sensory uh, memory. And then there's more elaborate type rehearsals. In the elaborate rehearsals, you're doing repetitions to try to move it from short-term memory now into your long-term memory. So it's that taking that new information that was previously stored in short term and now moving it in. So remember, that's what we consider to be a deeper level type of processing. Now, there's all types of ways to help you to remember. Mnemonic devices are those type of tricks that help you to take in and retain information. So some examples of doing that would be using acronyms, 
uh, creating outlines to help organize, and then also using the method of loci or being able to localize material or uh, objects to kind of help click your memory. Say like if you're driving somewhere and you use landmarks to get you to the place you want to go. That's that method of loci to be able to remember uh, within your long-term memory that you've utilized. That's a nanomic device. All right, so Loki, if y'all are Marvel fans, <laughs> that's not the person I'm thinking of right now, but this method of Loki is actually came along through Greek and um, Roman um, times. And it was the, their ability to keep track of all the different parts of the speeches that they had to make, because guess what? They made some long, long speeches. The orators kind of try to imagine parts of their speeches, and they put them in different parts mentally in the gardens so that when they're looking, they allow themselves to uh, be able to recall and remember. Now, one technique I use as a method of loci when I was in grad, student, um, grad school was I would study with music and mentally I would embed the material I was learning within a song so that as I'm singing a song to myself, and yes, I would write down what songs I was listening to. But when I start singing that song to myself, not only the lyrics come back to me, but so was the information that I was studying for. So that's something you might want to try. All right, so acronyms. Acronyms, now to be honest, for me is depending on what I'm using acronyms for. Using it for trying to remember psychology information, it never worked out for me that way. But for some, it do allow them to help remember that information. So acronyms is allowing yourself to create a new code word or a new sentence structure that would actually bring back the material for you in that sense. And still more about mnemonics. All right, in outline organization, when I'm lecturing, one of the things you can do is make an outline of everything that I'm saying. So, and put down some examples um, and details about the lecture to kind of help you to remember later on. This is what you could be doing right now. You can go through the nature of memory, memory models is what I also talked about, sensory memory, short-term memory, and put some detail that would help you to remember what was said. All right, retrieval cue. This is allowing you to see prompts that's going to help uh, stimulate uh, information that you have in your long-term memory. First, through recognition, this is allowing you to retrieve that memory using specific cues, like example, when I give you exams, you have multiple choice questions. And hopefully, if you did studying, the multiple choice is going to provide you with a cue of what the answer is. Then you simply have recall. This is being able to use non-specific clues, um, but general information that you have gained and picked up to be able to recall and retrieve information. Now, State-dependent retrieval. This is when you learn something while you're under the influence of something like caffeine. And you actually remember it a little better because you're kind of hyped up. But that's when you're using state-dependent retrieval. All right, it is the weekend. Um, so therefore, this is where I will be stopping. Um, and please do make sure that you complete the assignments. Uh, assignments from here on out will only have questions. No longer will they have the reading material attached. As some people, it, it kind of discombobulated them. So you should have your textbooks at this time. And please use your textbooks. 
All right. So with that being said, it's time to say ta-ta. Have a great weekend. Uh, next week will kind of be a light week. I will probably be only giving you one video lecture next week, uh, as well as only one assignment for the entire week. Uh, due to me having a medical procedure done next week, so it's going to kind of be light. If you do have any questions or concerns, please feel free to send me information in, through the inbox in Canvas. I know some students have struggled getting in contact with me. I don't know what's that about or why they're having trouble, but make sure you don't use the chat because I don't go into the chat enough. I do go into the inbox uh, every 24 to 48 hours. So please make sure you use that. And again, have a great one. Bye.